Chapter 32 MacLeod put the phone down and stared across the room at Rachel. Was that him? She said. He wants to meet me. He's got Brenda with him. Says he'll start cutting pieces from her if I don't get there soon. MacLeod slammed a fist down on the coffee table. What the hell did he have to involve her for? He knows I would have met him without all this. Rachel replied, It gives him an edge, a psychological edge. How can you concentrate fully on the fight when you have to worry about her too? The Kurgan does nothing without a purpose, it seems to me. He's taking a chance. You're all that stands between him and the prize. MacLeod nodded. That was it. The last battle. Perhaps he would be joining Heather and Ramirez before the night was over. That did not seem so bad. He was tired, very tired. He had lived too long. His whole being felt weary and dissipated. He picked up the samurai sword and strapped it to his back. Rachel watched him with dark eyes. What was she thinking? You're looking critical, he said. Does my hair need combing or something? Don't joke. I was just thinking that perhaps this was not the right time for you to meet him. Maybe you should choose your own time and place. He took out the gleaming blade and inspected it. Under the strong light of the apartment, he could see few blemishes to the metal. Two and a half thousand years of service that blade had given to two men. Now it had one last job to do. He ran his fingers down the pattern of the dragon on the handle. Beautiful workmanship. The blade itself had a pattern too. A set of Japanese characters. MacLeod knew what they said. No one lives forever. Typical of Ramirez's humour. Did you hear what I said? Asked Rachel. Yes, I did. I know you have my best interests at heart, but there's a woman out there. He'll kill her just like that. I have to go. His ground, his time. But I have to go just the same. Rachel said softly, are you in love with her? He sheathed the sword. I think so. That may be bad for you. It would be better if you had no emotional stake in this. He smiled. Not much I can do about it now, is there? You can stop yourself falling in love with someone, but once it's happened, you can't just shrug it off and forget about it. Can't you? No. You should have fallen in love, Rachel. There's still plenty of time. Maybe I will. There were tears in her eyes now, and he went to her and put his arms around her. Hey, come on. I'll be back. She hugged him to her. I don't know. I'm telling you. I'll be back. But you seem so dispirited, as if you're going out there with the wrong attitude to begin with. Do you want to die? He thought about that. Not now, he said. I have been low. When you were a little girl, you gave me a sense of purpose for a while. I had someone to take care of, someone who needed me to look after them. Never having had children before, it was a unique experience for me. I enjoyed it. We had great fun together, didn't we? Oh yes, yes. She sobbed against his shoulder. Lately, 
I've been feeling that I've had my time. But now, now I'm in love again, for the first time in four centuries. Now someone else needs me. It's worth trying to live. She smiled through her tears at him. Just keep it in mind. He left her then, taking the elevator to the street below. The Porsche was parked around the back. He climbed in, started the engine, and pulled away from the curb. Someone else did so at the same time. MacLeod looked in his rear-view mirror and saw that Bedso was tailing him. Shit! He slammed the Porsche into third and took off. Bedso was slow to respond and MacLeod managed to put at least three cars between himself and the cop before they reached the next turn-off. He gunned the Porsche down a side alley, hoping Bedso's Chevy was too wide to follow. It was, and it wasn't. The cop's vehicle touched the walls of the alley, but that did not stop him from going in. He crushed a few garbage cans in his efforts, too. McLeod pressed his speed advantage and managed to get to the next red light before Bedso, who, being the man he was, had to stop and watch his victim get frustratingly far ahead. By the time McLeod turned the next bend, Bedso was way behind and falling back further all the time. McLeod turned into a scrapyard and waited. Eventually, Bedso's vehicle went screaming past and disappeared. McLeod waited for a few more minutes, then turned out and in the opposite direction. He reached the Silver Cup building about 15 minutes later. Except for the sign, the whole place was in darkness. The windows, blackly reflecting the streetlights, glared at him balefully. Shadows filled every deep pocket of the building's recesses, any one of which could be harbouring the Kurgan's form. Somewhere up there, that double-edged broadsword was waiting to take MacLeod's head. He left the car and drew his sword. The Kurgan had mentioned the roof, but that did not mean he was up there. He could be anywhere on the way. The most likely route was up the fire escape. MacLeod began to climb the rusty ironwork, trying to keep his footfalls soft. At each platform he stopped to listen. The Kurgan would have heard the arrival of the car, so Brenda was no longer in danger. It was best to travel cautiously than not to arrive at all. Just before the top, about 15 stories up, MacLeod put his coat against a window and broke it with as little noise as possible, using the handle of his sword. Somewhere in the depths of the building below, a dog barked for a while. Then... All was silent again. MacLeod reached inside, through the hole in the glass, and opened the window. Then he climbed into the darkness inside. Glass cracked underfoot. He moved towards the wall and felt his way around until he came to a door. It was not locked. He opened it and crept along the passage until he came to a stairway leading to the final story. He went up, slowly. At the top of the stairs, he found himself in an enormous empty studio with walls of glass and a glass roof, presumably for the light it afforded cameramen. The moonlight shone through the windows, hundreds of them, and onto the empty floor. It was an eerie place but at least MacLeod could see into all its corners and ascertain that the Kurgan was not lurking there, ready to decapitate him. How to get to the roof without being seen? MacLeod's eyes scanned the room. In one corner was a gantry with a rope hanging from it. Above this crane was a skylight. MacLeod put his sword in his sheath and began climbing the rope. 
He reached the beam swaying dangerously, but managed to haul himself on top. The window to the skylight proved to be a bit tricky. Rust had stuck it fast. MacLeod took out his sword and, balanced precariously on the gantry, ran the point of the blade around the edge of the window. This time it opened. He crawled through and out onto the roof. He could hear someone moaning. On the rooftop hard, just in front of him, was a huge erection bearing the silver cup sign, and he thought the sound was coming from that direction. He studied the framework and caught the flutter of some material in the wind. Then he saw her, tied to the metal poles. Now, where was the Kurgan?